Welcome to Hot Chips 2023. Session 8. FPGAs and Cooling. This is the final session um, of Hot Chips uh, 2023. Uh, happy to uh, be the sponsor. I'm Forrest Basket from New Enterprise Associates. Um, been fortunate to be part of Hot Chips for a very long time. Um, so this session is titled uh, FPGAs and Cooling. I would uh, rather call it FPGAs as chiplets um, and cooling. Uh, chiplets are the new approach to divide and con to conquer for big systems and I'm happy to see uh, FPGAs becoming a, an active part of that. Um, our first talk is uh, from AMD, AMD's next generation FPGA built from chiplets. Um, the speaker is Dinesh Gaitondi, he's a senior fellow at AMD. He's worked on FPGA architectures, applications, algorithms, and EDA as FPGAs over, his, over the past 15 years. He holds a PhD from Carnegie Mellon in electrical engineering and computer engineering. Uh, Denise? Thank you, Forrest, for that intro, and welcome everyone to my talk. It should come as no surprise to anyone in this audience, especially given the talks over the last couple of days, when I say that compute demand has exploded over the last couple of last few years. We've been able to manage this compute demand by deploying very advanced semiconductor nodes and increasingly advanced packaging integration techniques. The cost of bringing these uh, devices to market, however, has been growing as the technologies have advanced. At current nodes, the cost of designing uh, any device is dominated by the cost of uh, verifying the design, validating the design, developing software for that design. And this chunk that verifying the design takes is expected to increase over uh, subsequent nodes. So it's imperative on the community that we left shift as much of the verification tasks as possible and improve designer productivity when it comes to validating user designs. <clears throat> for several years now, FPGAs have been key for verification acceleration. FPGAs are the underlying compute that occurs in a wide variety of uh, verification solutions that I'm sure everyone in this audience uses. FPGAs are spatial architectures and uh, they prefer unrolling compute in space. And so larger FPGAs naturally provide better performance for these workloads. So when it comes to designing FPGAs to accelerate verification, we want to build as large an FPGA as possible. So within the context of verification, let's look at a few other requirements that such a device needs to have in order to perform well in this market. Of course, I already spoke about larger devices. Larger devices means larger canvas uh, for the user to map uh, their design on. The designs, as I said, that we are implementing today don't fit in one FPGA when you are trying to emulate it. For example, you need several FPGAs. And when a design has to span several FPGAs, uh, the abundance and uh, latency of the interfaces with which the one FPGA communicates with another one is key for performance. And finally, since one is using the FPGA in this context for debug to uh, 
to verify the design, some key verification primitives like checkpointing design state, restoring from checkpoints, monitoring signals needs to be as high performance and as, tra as user transparent as possible. Xilinx, now part of AMD, has been uh, designing and bringing to market capacity-busting FPGAs over the last uh, 16 years or so. Our uh, latest device that was announced two years ago uh, on one device supports 9 million logic cells and enables solution provider to provide solutions which scale up to 30 billion gates. In this line of capacity bursting device, we are excited to announce our latest AMD Versal VP1902 Adaptive SoC. This is by far the world's largest FPGA for verification acceleration. I'll go into the uh, specifics of its capacity, how we were able to achieve this capacity. What we did as far as the microarchitecture is concerned in order to improve on the key verification requirements that I mentioned in the previous slide will form bulk of the rest of the talk. So let's talk about some of the top line numbers. Compared to our previous generation architecture view 19P, this device has twice the capacity as defined across any dimension that you care about. Twice the logic density, twice uh, the I.O. bandwidth, twice transceiver bandwidth, and so on. <clears throat> Not just the capacity, but several key microarchitectural decisions have gone into making this device a very effective device for verification. I won't go into uh, through all of these. I'll just highlight a couple of them. This is the first device, VP1902 is the first uh, AMD device targeting verification which has a processing subsystem hardened in it. Verification is now moving up from simple RTL verification to design verification, system verification. And the flexible boot and control that this processing subsystem brings to the table enables that transition. VP1902 also has a programmable high bandwidth device pervasive network on chip. Almost every aspect of the network on chip is programmable. The topology is programmable, the quality of service is programmable, um, where the uh, masters and the clients sit, uh, where the server sits, where the client sits on that topology is programmable as well. There are several such uh, uh, benefits. What the programmable NOC brings to the table is key infrastructure tasks during verification. For example, moving the debug data from one end of the chip to somewhere off the chip can be orchestrated now over this programmable NOC without involving the core fabric, thereby leaving more of the core fabric available for user design. So I hope I've convinced you by now that we want to build large FPGAs. But building large FPGAs is not economical. This is of course not new. Any compute platform is, is, uh, uh, has similar constraints. But because of the programmability tax, this constraint is more acute for FPGAs. Programmability gives us tremendous advantages. But the same functionality implemented in a programmable context takes more silicon area than the same, same functionality implemented in, uh, in custom silicon. So we need to innovate. And just like anybody, everybody else in the industry, what we have done is chipletize. Now once again, the notion of chiplets in the context of FPGA is again not new especially when it, when, when, when it comes, uh, when I'm talking about AMD FPGAs. We've been building chiplet-based FPGAs for the last three generations. A few key points about how chiplets work in the context of AMD FPGAs bear illustrating. When it comes time to building a large FPGA, the view that we want to give to the user is 
that they have a large fabric, they have a large canvas on which to map user design, a large undifferentiated canvas. When in practice, the, the silicon is actually made up of discrete pieces. So the semantics of the wire that goes from one chiplet to the other needs to be the same as the semantics of a wire that stays within a chiplet. There is no protocol that we enforce when users map their design from A to B, from one chiplet to the other. If required, a protocol is overlaid by the end user. The underlying architecture requires no such protocol. And maintaining this user view of an undifferentiated canvas is what our tools manage when they map a user design on a chiplet-based FPGA. Let's talk about the way we've traditionally built FPGAs in AMD with chiplets and see what issues arise when we go to newer technologies. So traditionally, FPGAs, AMD FPGAs have been built in a columnar manner. So you take one chiplet and stack one on top of the other and build a large device. What this lets us do, of course, is with one tape out, we are able to bring to market several FPGAs devices with, several, uh, with, with different capacities. All signals that are part of one FPGA simply extend vertically. So clocking extends vertically, uh, the interconnect extends vertically, uh, the configuration of the device also extends vertically. Everything extends vertically. This relatively straightforward way of assembling uh, an FPGA, however, is running out of steam. And I'll highlight a couple of reasons why. The first is as technologies are scaling, IOs are not scaling. Just like any other resource in an FPGA, in AMD FPGAs, IOs come in columns. So when we design one chiplet, we have a column of IOs and that entire column simply extends when we build multiple chiplets. It's a very simple arrangement. But because the IOs are not scaling, delays of wires that cross IOs are much larger than the delays of wires that stay on one side of the IO. And this gulf between these two delays is widening with uh, more advanced nodes. Logic scales, but the IO doesn't scale. And keeping the user view of an undifferentiated fabric is becoming harder and harder with this. So what did we do? So one natural way of dealing with this shown with the figure on the left is we could move the IOs north and south. If you move the IOs north and south, of course, now the problem within one chiplet is fine. You don't have to ever cross IOs. But now when you're going from one chiplet to the other, the delay worsened. So again, the problem of creating an undifferentiated fabric became harder on our tools. Also, bonding out those IOs that occur in the middle of this extremely complicated large device is very hard. So instead, what we did is we built a 2 by 2 FPGA. This is a much harder FPGA to engineer because now you need to guarantee that signals continue not just in the vertical direction, but also horizontally. Everything, every system level functionality now, we have to manage both in a programmable way. So it's, it's but the returns on this more complex device, we thought were worth, uh, worth the benefits. And let me talk about a couple of benefits. When a user maps their design on an FPGA, our tools try to manage the cut between FPGAs. What, that, what, I, what I mean by that is they try to place the design in the, say, 1x4 FPGA so that the track demanded between SLRs, between uh, chiplets, is as low as possible, or at least within what we are, within what we are providing for. All said and done, we have tremendous bandwidth between chiplets, but the bandwidth between chiplets is still a fraction of the bandwidth that's available within one device. So this is a first class problem for our tools. What the two by two arrangement does is significantly reduce the demand on tracks for wires that cross chiplets. And across customer designs, we've noticed up to 40% reduction in tracks demanded. So the tools now have a much easier time presenting to the user an undifferentiated fabric. So 
we want to build large FPGAs. So we have large dies sitting on an even larger interposer. So what we do there is our interposer now is multiples of a reticle limit. And the way we do it is we have one exposure with say the metal traces, our interposer is passive. So we have one fourth of the uh, exposure shown over here. We have some keep out region where we don't permit micro bumps for the uh, chiplet integration. And then we simply have multiple exposures of the same die, of the, of the same multiple exposures of the same uh, geometry several times in order to create a large interposer. In theory, with this technique, we could have gone up to 4x of the reticle limit. But for mechanical reasons and to manage other cons constraints, VP1902 is about 3x the reticle size, still quite large. <sighs> Having spoken about how we built this FPGA, let me now spend a little bit of time talking about what's the performance of this FPGA compared to our previous generation. Now, of course, performance is a more complicated concept in the context of verification because a device design that just needs one device has different bottlenecks for performance than a device than a, than a design that needs multiple devices. So when a design just needs one device, the core fabric performance determines your system performance. And when the design is so large that it needs to span multiple devices, interface performance is the key bottleneck. So let's talk about this. We've improved core performance simply because, you know, it's a seven nanometer chip compared to our previous 16 nanometer chip. So core performance improved commensurate with technology. But all the other things that I've talked about, twice the device size, two by two arrangement, use of the hardened programmable knock, all of them contribute to improving core system performance because either they get out of the way of uh, design implementation. So the design implementation is not hampered, for example, in the case of NOC, or make our tool problem easier so they don't have to sacrifice performance in order to manage uh, interchiplet communication. Let's talk about performance in the context of systems that our solution providers will build from these FPGAs. So I've, here I have two uh, candidate proposals, uh, one using our previous generation uh, FPGA and one using uh, uh, the FPGA that we're just announcing. And you can see the capacity of these two is the same. You need half as many uh, VP1902s because VP1902 device capacity is twice V19P device capacity. So imagine a user design is mapped on this system. The user design is likely to span not just multiple chiplets, but also multiple devices. Any of these transitions, tra chiplet transitions, or transitions across device incurs a penalty in terms of performance. What we have done in VP1902 is substantially improve the performance of these key interfaces. So not only do we see performance improvement just because we have to go through fewer transitions for the same critical path. But also all the key parameters that define the delay of that critical path have reduced considerably. Let me take an example. Let's suppose I have a design. I'm mapping them to two FPGAs just for um, uh, just as an example. Whenever I take a design and map it to two FPGAs, the number of wires that cross is order of magnitude, orders of magnitude more than the number of physical IOs that we have on an FPGA. We have a lot of physical IOs on VP1902, but even so, the number of nets that need to cross is an order of magnitude more. So of course we time multiplex them. So when we time multiplex this, the latency of that time multiplexed interface is a key determinant of system performance. And in VP1902, we've managed to reduce the performance, oh, sorry, re reduce the latency of these uh, key interfaces by about 36%. As the graph shows, this results in significant performance uplift. Even when the number of nets that cross across FPGAs is very demanding. So even under very demanding scenarios, we expect VP1902 to show significant performance. Finally, as I said, 
we are not talking of a verification focused FPGA just to talk about system performance. The key verification tasks of readback of uh, checkpointing state are first class problems to be solved when it comes to verification based FPGA. I'm going to talk about a couple of ways we have improved readback, the reading the design state in VP1902. One, where we have simply improved what was possible in previous AMD FPGAs and the other, a new technique that is specifically made possible given the microarchitecture of VP1902. Let me talk about the traditional technique first. Traditionally, you've been able to read the state of AMD FPGAs for quite a while now. But all the plumbing that lets you read the design state now has seen significant improvement in performance. We have doubled the frequency of that uh, readback mechanism and quadrupled the bus size. What this means is we can now have 8x improved readback bandwidth compared to, VP19, compared to VU19P. Not just that, each cycle of readback, and I don't have time to go into the details of that, each cycle of readback has been made more efficient, which permits an additional 8x improvement. Readback performance has seen a significant uplift in uh, this generation of uh, verification FPGAs. What we are able to do uniquely in VP1902 now is take design registers, create shadow registers from design registers, create a custom scan chain between them, and drain all of those scan chains in device pervasive network on chip ports. Network on chip ports, net network on chip, the programmable network on chip that I just mentioned, their ports are pervasive throughout the device. There are just under 200 network on chip ports on VP1902. So you can build a a lot of scan chains running at very high frequencies, uh, close to the maximum frequency supported by the device, like a gigahertz or so, and 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 drain them out through knock and then uh, off chip for uh, debug analysis. Using this technique, we are able to do 12 times better performance for readback than what is possible on already improved readback hardware. We've spent a lot of engineering in order to make readback really high performance in this generation. When it comes time to talk about a large device, it's not just enough to talk about uh, the hardware. Um, in the interest of time, I only have one slide for software, but the user view of our FPGA is first through software and then later through the silicon. Building a large device, building a device twice the size of the previous device means that our software needs to keep up to speed as well. In this generation, Vivado, which is our software that takes user design, user RTL maybe, say, and map it to uh, a device has seen significant improvements. I'll just talk about one of them. In this generation, we are now able to take a user design, partition it under the hood for them, manage all partition level constraints, do timing budgeting, readjust those timing budgets as implementation goes on, and at the same time, implement each of those partitions more or less independently. This gives us substantial improvement in uh, the mapping uh, performance of our FPGs, of, of, of our software tools. So Vivado is able to uh, map user designs much faster as a result of this. Once again, this is just uh, one of the improvements that uh, I'm going to be talking about. There are a whole host of other improvements. And in other forums, I'm sure there will be software experts who will talk about all the other improvements that have gone into Vivado in this time frame to support these such large FPGs. So in short, the VP1902 Adaptive SOC brings to the market huge increases in capacity, twice the increase in capacity, twice the increase in uh, uh, connectivity, huge improvement in its debug capabilities, and the software tool that supports all of this being up-leveled significantly. Thank you. That was uh, my talk. I would as, as, as I uh, click through the slides, I'd like to mention that I'm here on behalf of a diverse 
engineering, not just engineering, a diverse team of uh, people at AMD who've been behind this, uh, who have helped make this uh, reality. And I hope I've done justice to their work. Thank you. So uh, some questions, what about uh, someone from Slack? Yeah, we can start with Slack. A uh, question from Michael Mortensen, Skyworks. Are there any plans to support UCI chiplets for specialized peripheral types and or accelerators? So AMD is part of the UCI consortium. I cannot speak about plans on the future. <laughs> uh, there's also one more question about UCI. Uh, one of the powers of FPGA is their reconfigurability. Does AMD have plans for providing UCI anchor die FPGAs enabling customers to build complex chiplet systems that are adaptable? Once again, <laughs> AMD is part of UCI. Yeah, I cannot, cannot talk about future plans. Yeah. I'll bet this topic comes up again. <laughs> um, on this side? Uh, Alan Baum, Esperanto. Um, you have you introduced a part that doesn't have a tape out, it has two tape outs because you have something that's mirror imaged. Has that caused any other issues with verification and everything else? That's a very good observation. Um, you're right. So it's not a single tape out, it's two tape outs. And we had a lot of sort of, there was a lot of back and forth about that because that's an, that's an additional cost. But the benefits are worth it. But coming back to your question about design cost. Every task leading up to that is identical. It's the same RTL, it's the same everything. It's a mirror image. The mirror image causes some back and late back end complications, sure. But they were not, given the, given the scope of the project, they were not a huge impact either on cost or on schedule. Yeah. Uh, next up here. Reminiscing at Chronix. Thanks to Nash for your presentation. I actually had the same question, so I'll ask another one. Um, my question is, uh, were you able to uh, keep or increase the number of uh, wires between the, the chiplets uh, from where it was in the previous generation, or were you able to increase that? Number? So we, so that is pretty much decided by the micro bump pitch. So I can't speak to the actual micro bump pitch that we used. There are a few tricks we play there, so I, I can't go into the details of that. But uh, you know the technology, you know the micro-bump scaling roadmap. And so from that, you can just back calculate how much it is. So our biggest effort this generation has been to make those metal traces more efficient rather than increase their count. As you can see, the two by two construction makes it much more efficient. It's more likely that uh, one, one piece of copper wire is now uh, taking more burden, essentially, let me put it that way. So it's, it's more useful in a two by two construction than in a one by four. Thank you. Uh, from Slack? Yeah, question from Tong Tong Chen Sig. In a two by two SLR configuration, do the two diagonal SLRs have direct connections? Uh, no, okay. they do not. Uh, and can you also comment on the, any latency improvements in, in terms of service system latency comparing to? Yes. SERDIS so system latency has improved quite a bit. I'm not reporting on it here because for the performance, for given how AMD FPGAs are deployed, IO latency is the key determinant of system performance. Given how they are, that's not to say that people won't build other systems. Given how they are deployed today, that's a key determinant. SERDIS uh, so latency has improved. Yes, Thank you. quite a bit. Yeah. Um, one more up here on the left. Nathan Brookwood from Insight 64. In one of your charts, it looked like you were suggesting that the uh, various tiles can be stacked vertically as well as horizontally across the interposer. I thought you were always doing two and a half D and not three D. So is this a, a new technology for you? No, this is this is just two and a half D. This is the interposer is passive. It's Covas. There's nothing nothing new there. It's just that architecturally, I cannot afford to do a one by four anymore. Uh, given the given 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 the design sizes and the size of this uh, device, but there are single tiles then mounted on an interposer yes. and not stacked. Yes. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, yeah, one more uh, question from Sly. Uh, one more from Sly. Yeah, um, this is from Michael Mortensen Skyworks. The scanner technology is quite nice. Is it managed via a system like secure re-enablement re to prevent malicious scan out? Okay, so the scan technique is purely a software enabled technique. So what the way it is imagined is the user has mapped their user design and they have simply identified some signals that, that they want to monitor. And that could be 100% of the registers, for example. And the tooling, the, our solution suppliers and us together will make that transparent by building custom scan chains. So it is not, <clears throat> it is not a platform managed scan. It is a tooling managed scan. So it is as secure as any other logic you've mapped on our, on, 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 on our FPGS, yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, Dinesh, this has been excellent. And so let's thank Dinesh for the one. Thank you. Our next talk is by Ben Esposito. It's, uh, the title is Intel's uh, Agilus X9 uh, uh, Direct RF FPGAs with integrated 64-bit um, gigas somethings per second data converter. I should have found that earlier. Um, ben Esposito is a senior principal engineer in radar um, and um, um, systems architect for the Intel Programmable Slits Systems Group. He's the lead architect on um, um, responsible for developing heterogeneous integrated multi-chip package solutions for radar and electronic warfare applications, including uh, the direct um, RF series FPGAs to be presented today. He has over 25 plus years experience supporting DSP workloads in FPGAs and has been a key contributor in developing the DSP strategy at his, uh, at his group, including DSP silicon features, tools, and IP product definition. He holds a BS EE and an MS EE from New Jersey Institute of Technology, has um, 19 patents for FPGAs architectures, and porting of DSP algorithms to FPGAs. Uh, so Ben, uh, welcome. Thank you. Now in San Diego. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm here to talk about, we have uh, Agile X9 Direct RF FPGAs with integrated 64 uh, giga sample data converters. And what you'll learn from the presentation is uh, what we do from heterogeneous integrated FPGAs and how we stitch them together. So the first couple of uh, bullets up here will actually show you uh, some examples of uh, FPGAs, how we stitch them together using our, or the methodology we use. Uh, then we'll talk about our Direct RF. Uh, actually get into the architecture of the 64 giga sample data converter chiplet and show some performance, some test results, and some development tools and reference designs. I have a video of a reference design that actually shows us operating and consuming 32 giga gigahertz of bandwidth in the FPGA in real time. And then uh, talk a little bit about futures. So if you look, what we do, we have um, both Stratix 10 and Agilex, our heterogeneous integrated uh, FPGAs that employ a chiplet-based methodology. If you look down at the bottom, we have three examples. The first on the left uses a Stratix 10 architecture that's running at 14 nanometer FPGA fabric. You can see it has two data converted uh, chiplets on the left and two transceiver tiles. If you move to the middle one, that's Agilex. And if you move to the right one, that's uh, Agilex is done on 10 nanometer superfin, and the right one is an Agilex M series, which actually is done on Intel 7. And if you look across the bottom, you'll see different foundry nodes, different fa uh, process nodes, different chiplets, um, partners, and it's all about picking the right chiplet on a given node that makes sense in terms of features and or cost. There's no reason to push state of the art to every chiplet you do if, in fact, you're getting what you need a given node, or in the case of analog, you may not want to be on the most aggressive node, stay on a node that's optimized for analog. 
So how do we do it? Well, we actually leverage Intel's embedded multi-die interconnect bridge. And you can see down there on the bottom right, there's a picture of uh, the C4 bumps and micro bumps. And micro bumps is the, inter inter uh, the high density parallel path between the two adjacent chiplets. And the larger C4 bumps are there. Intel took a leadership role and released AIB as an open standard. And that's our physical layer. Now we use EMIB to uh, connect our chiplets, AIB over EMIB, but you don't need to use uh, EMIB with AIB. You can use interposers uh, to get the same equivalent. And there's some metrics there in terms of the AIB and the EMIB interface and in terms of parallelism, of the bandwidth set there. It's, but most importantly, it's all about power and latency. We have these very high speed, high bandwidth converters. We want to bring them from a data converter tile into the FPGA. How do we do that and how do we do that at lower power? So if you look at the ch a chiplet ecosystem, Intel, we develop chiplets, and you can call an FPGA a chiplet. It's a big chiplet, but it's a chiplet. And we also do connectivity. Then we have third-party partners also developing, and those are data converter partners. You'll see a couple of products with two different data converter partners who, in our part, security and connectivity for some other examples. And then we have a unique public-private relationship with the government. We actually were awarded a contract of under ship state-of-the-art heterogeneous integration packaging, which allows um, access to allow uh, the defense industrial base to get access to custom multi-chip uh, packages. And if you look on the right there, the AIBs are done on three foundries and nine process nodes. Uh, those are chiplets kind of summarizing. Again, noting that it's technology and foundry agnostic. So if we look at example, how do we put these two together? How do we put rather um, these uh, MCPs, these chiplet-based FPGAs together? Across the top left, you see some big chiplets. Those are our FPGAs. I have both the Stratix 10, 14 nanometer example, as well as two Agilex examples, the 10 nanometer Superfin. And on the right are a bunch of different personalities in terms of chiplets that we'll stitch together. So the first one we'll do is we'll look at the um, Stratix 10AX part, which is our first direct RF product. You can see we have the base 14 nanometer die. We actually integrate two data converter tiles, chiplets that are shown in red, and two different transceiver tiles, each optimized for a different personality. One is optimized for Ethernet, and the other is optimized for PCI. And the idea behind it is how do you get the time to market faster through reuse and standardization? The standardization is the AIB interface. The reuse is taking chiplets that are already improving in a past product and moving it forward. So we can create a, a next generation RF product, and in this case, we move the data converter tile forward, put down a new FPJ fabric, take advantage of Agilex's um, benefits it brings in terms of compute per watt and performance, but you also saw a new uh, transceiver tile, backhaul uh, tile shown in green come down. So now we upgraded the tile when available. Once we've done that, done that, we have a new data converter tile in Agilex, a new data converter tile, and a transceiver tile already proven in Agilex, and we can do a quick derivative product. In this case, we put down a bigger FPGA fabric, and then we put two data converter tiles. We reuse those, and then we also reuse the transceiver tiles. We, what we do next is we take that concept and we reuse the FPGA and the transceiver tiles, but now we replace it with a different data converter tile. And if you look at the bottom right there, those are our Agilex Direct RF uh, Series FPGAs. The bottom left there is a Stratix 10. So those four products represent our portfolio today of Direct RF products. Uh, we're going to here to talk about Agilex, and we'll get into some more details on the, the wideband 64 giga sample in a moment. But if you look at what else we have in the Agilex family, we have a, three other series. On the top left, you have F series and the middle I series and on the top right you have the M series and if you can look at the uh, pictures there you'll see that in the base FPJ die itself we can put different hard IP blocks and create different personalities based on market needs so you have a base uh, on the left there is an F series if you want to say that's our general purpose one the middle one if you can read it says a hard crypto IP so we had a hard crypto IP and that's more of a networking chip and on the right you can see we added hard IP to support DDR5 as well as an on die knock to support the HBM. When you and the performance metrics there, I'm not going to go through with them. You can look at them. 
offline. But when you look at this, the six devices I show here, again, in terms of the number of different chiplets, the foundries, the process nodes, and external partners. Uh, there's other device derivatives available. These are just the six that I'm bringing up here. So let's talk about the direct RF why we're here at a 64 giga sample part we have. Um, as noted previously, on the previous slide rather, we have two different uh, personalities for the data converters. Two devices use the wide band converter. One device is uses a medium band converter. And you can see the difference there. We're not gonna talk about the medium band today. We're just gonna talk about the wide band converter. And they, uh, each tile, it's a quad-based architecture. And if you have two tiles in it, you can get up to eight separate 64 giga sample ADCs and eight separate 64 giga sample DACs. So if you look at the architecture as a quad, it's 40 to 64 giga samples. We have frequency agility across the entire Nyquist zone, and plus some. So 32 gigahertz of bandwidth plus a little bit out to 30, 36 gigahertz. Uh, we have the ability to consume that in the FPJ because we have that AIB interface. So this is the only part on Earth that can actually consume that data in the FPJ and process the full wideband uh, spectrum. And we'll show you a, a demo of that in a, a few minutes. Um, we, uh, in terms of if you can't support that much bandwidth, most people can't, we have on die up digital up down conversion and you can bring it down to something more manageable and the management is 8, 8x to 1024x. So you can bring it down as low as 62.5 megahertz from 32 gigahertz if you use. In terms of synchronization, which is important for coherent beam forming, we have support for that and we actually have single device and multi-device uh, reference designs to highlight that. Moving on. In terms of when you when you look at a 64 giga sample data converter, we don't run our parts of 64 giga samples inside our FPGAs. What it is, it's an interleaved architecture up on the tile. So there needs to be some type of calibration and correction uh, to go with all the individual interleaved A to D converters that are up there. So we put all those compensation networks up on the tile. Nothing's done in an FPGA. That saves resources, that saves power when you integrate the full solution together. We do have a separate parallel port for each A to D DAC pair, and that allows us to do fast control and fast updates. We already talked about the AIB standard, and it's all about power and latency. Without JES D204B serializer, deserializer, and the JES D204B or C protocol, we substantially reduce that uh, latency associated with it and the, and the power associated with it. When you look at what we're doing, um, historically, a lot of this circuitry has been done in analog and we're pulling it into the digital world. So you can get about a six to eight X improvement in um, size reduction. What used to be done on multiple boards is now done on a single board and most of that in a single device. So what we'll do is we'll step through the architecture just to give you a flavor of what the capabilities are. This is a, it's a dual stage digital down converter. It consists of a, a core stage and a fine stage. The core stage has 500 megahertz of NCO tuning. The fine NCO has less than a hertz, 0 0.8 hertz uh, tuning. And if you look at our different modes we'll step through, number one, we mentioned we can pull in that 32 gigahertz of bandwidth. So we have a buy one mode, pulls it right into the FPGA. The tuning, if you look now in the course tuner, we have two different options. One is a by eight. The by eight allows you to 64 divide by eight. You got eight gigahertz of bandwidth and based on the tuner, you can pull that anywhere within that spectrum. Next one is a by four, same thing, tune four gigahertz of bandwidth um, and anywhere within that spectrum by the NCO one. If you want to decimate further, you take that block and you move it into the fine tuner. The fine tuner allows us to series of half band decimators, uh, step it down up to 1024. So this is just showing within that band, you can get two gig, one gig, all the way down to, as I mentioned, uh, 62.5. We actually have four tuners. We don't have one tuner, fine tuner. So once you have a block of four gigahertz of interest, we can actually go in there and get four separate, up to four different bands of one gigahertz or less. If you want two gigahertz, you'll get two. So the aggregate bandwidth's equivalent. One channel at four gigahertz is the same as two channels at two gigahertz, which is the same as four channels at one gigahertz. I'm showing the two gigahertz budding up as well as the one gigahertz overlapping because they're fully independent tunable. 
if I look at the transmit architecture, the transmit architecture is similar. It's, it's, there, there are some differences we'll talk about. Them. Number one is we have a summer. We have to sum the uh, tuners together before we send it to the DAC. Each summer has a gain adjust that's um, in there so that we don't clip the DAC. If you have one channel, you can have a, a higher signal. If you have two channels or three or four, so you have separate channels. And they are phase, they are complex. So if you want to do some phase shifting, you can do it right there. The other thing you'll note is we do not have a 1x mode. We only have a, a, an interpolate by eight only is, is, is relative. It's still eight gigahertz of bandwidth that we're bringing up versus 32 gigahertz of bandwidth. So those few slides are all summarized in this one table and a step down through it. If you look at mode A up top, that's the A to D running in wideband mode. And if you look across in the middle column, it talks about our instantaneous bandwidth. Then you see how many coarse or fine tuners you have, DDCs that is, and then the total number of RF channels, you can actually consume any FPGA. So number A gives us one channel at that 32. B and C, we actually have two by eight modes, and we do that depending upon our customer's needs. The first one is um, ADEX-F, which is full uh, resolution in terms of the bit width. We have 16-bit I and Q, which gives us two channels. If you look at the bandwidth, it's equivalent. If we have eight giga samples times 16 bit i and q times two channels that comes out to 512 gigabits per second if you look at number c what we have is four channels of 8 bit i and q that's also 512 gigabits per second uh, mode d is actually divide by 16 which puts us at four gigahertz of bandwidth and in that case we have all four channels of i cubed um, and at that 512 Mode E is when we start having the ability to add access to those additional fine tuners. So in mode E, we get access to those two. In mode F and above, you get access to four. Um, so pretty flexible depending upon what you're doing. In the end, we can give you up to 16 one gigahertz ports coming off of one tile. We have two tiles in the park, so we can give you 32 uh, one gigahertz ports coming from within a tile. We'll look at some data. Um, not going to spend a lot of time on the data. You can look at it offline. If you want to talk to us, you can do so. This is a single capture of one device, one port, 32 gigahertz of the ADC converter, about three gigahertz. It says what it is in there, three, three and change. Um, and then what the next slide is, is actually, instead of just showing you one slide, we actually sum a lot of um, parts together and a lot of ports together. And on the left is Spurs free dynamic range in a by one mode. And on the right is a uh, Spurs free dynamic range in a by 16 mode, and that highlights the benefits of an oversampled data converter. When you decimate down, you get coherent gain, and the coherent gain is shown clearly when you go from by 1 to by 16 here. Some other plots, some power input power, total harmonic distortion. Um, I'm not going to I'm not going to go into them. You can look offline. Similarly on the DAC again, this is the AGRW014 which is the smaller device with only single tile. This shows 32 gigahertz of the DAC bandwidth. Um, the, and then some we don't have a by one mode, so here we only have a by 16 mode for the DAC and uh, and the power shown as well as total harmonic distortion um, here. So if we look at what we have, when these parts are complex, to actually use them we have boards to get you started. Top is the AGRW14, which is a single tile device. The bottom is a dual tile device. Uh, you get access to all the RF inputs that you would want. There's, uh, there's memory on board. You get access to all the DDR that we, get, we put out. We fully populate it for you, as well as the backhaul. Transceivers are fully populated at the back end for Ethernet and PCI. And all the, our devices, all our direct RF devices, devices have a quad arm 853 architecture embedded in, embedded rather in the FPGA. In terms of what do we have in the tools, and if you went to the table outside, we were showing some of these tools or, or designs. So we have a design suite that allows us to uh, play back and capture the data and do some other things. Now, all of them are designed at a high level. We're actually using what we call DSP Builder Advanced Block Set, which is an Intel, Intel's MATLAB Simulink Block Set plugin. Allows you to design your design in Simulink and we'll generate the RTL for you. And those uh, designs include a channelizer, wideband agility, I'm gonna show you in a couple 
couple of moments. Uh, we also have the multi, um, multi device phase synchronization. If you are doing beam forming across multiple devices, we got a demo to show you how to do that. The time delay beam forming as well. And then on the bottom picture there is we have an RF evaluation platform, which is a MATLAB script-based environment which allows you to use, with, use MATLAB for what it's good for. You can put the testing in loops and capture a lot of data offline, go back and analyze it, and some other tools as well. So just a note on the wideband channelizer. It looks like a spectrum analyzer. Here we have a single channel on our A to D, 64 giga sample A to D. It looks like a spectrum analyzer. Um, we're actually consuming the full bandwidth continuously in the FPGA. We bring in all, uh, it says there are 128 samples in parallel through the AIB interface. We're running it at 500 megahertz of 128 samples is equivalent at one sample at 64 giga samples. And then we do super sample rate processing in the FPGA. Again, this is done at Mal lab and Simulink and we generate the code for you. This has a polyphase filter bank um, in it in addition to the FFT so it's got a real nice lowered spectrum. The next design I show you does not have the filter bank we just have an FFT so if you see difference in the performance it's due to not having that additional capability built in. So what design I'm going to show you is actually try to highlight the capability to part in one, in one uh, reference design. We'll have one of our tiles, we have a part with two tiles in it, we actually have one part running at 32 gigahertz full wideband mode. We're going to consume that in the FPJ, we're going to run a continuous FFT, we're going to detect signals, we're going to detect where that is, and we're going to program the other chiplet into a narrow band tracker. Now in this case, we're calling narrow band 4 gigahertz, which is really not narrow band. That's pretty wide band signal, but relative to 32 gigahertz, it's narrow band. We can, as a note, we can get that up to um, 16. Instead of us just showing one here, you can get 16 of those 1 gigahertz, as I mentioned a few moments ago, and it's shown down in that bottom picture. So this is the, if, if, the, if the video doesn't work, uh, I'll come back and talk to this one. So th this is the... Um, this is the video. If you look on the left, bottom left, we have the wideband receiver. There's 32 gigahertz of bandwidth shown there. On the bottom right is the narrow band tracker, which has plus or minus two gigahertz complex, which is the narrow band tracker. Um, what, we, what we're doing now is programming the FPJ, and what first pops up is you're going to see uncorrected data. You're going to see raw data coming off our data converters in both the wideband mode as well as the narrow band mode. Now the narrow band doesn't have a set. The blue box there, that sets the right there. That's the uncorrected on the left. There's no signal on the right because we got to tune the narrow band where that signal's sitting. It's sitting about 10 gigahertz. We just tuned it and it's over there. What we're going to do now is pull calibration coefficients and push them up onto the tile and set up the compensation networks. So we have one-time programmable fuses up there. We just check which one we have. In this case, we'll pick one around where we're at about 10 gigahertz. So the noise floor drop, it's not as nice as the channelizer based upon, likewise, we're doing it on the right. In this case, it's a narrow band and um, let it kick in. So now on the left, we have um, the wide band on the right. We have the narrow band. Both are optimized for coefficients. What you'll see is now as we sweep the frequency, it only you only see it on the right when we actually push the frequency through that 10 gigahertz. What we're going to do in a moment is we're going to turn on frequency hopping. So as that actually moves through, the narrow band is tracking as it goes. And if you look at where the cursor is right now on the right side of there, you'll see that it comes in about 50, 50 microseconds or so. So as you hop to another frequency, you're actually getting an optimized coefficient to go with it and at that frequency. And so what we've also done is we've enhanced that so that those co that coefficient that you hop to is going to check a box right now. And now we're going to do agility mode where you actually hop um, in less than a microsecond, not hop, you're hopping all the time, but you're actually tracking that other signal that's detected on the bottom left in less than a microsecond. Um, so what we also have, as you can see, we have FFT there. So we're running 1024 point FFT. You may not need a 1024 point FFT to do your search, which is the left band. If we drop it to 64, you can have the right side operating at 1024, which is zooming in close while the wide band is, is doing it. But in this case, we're showing both of them at 64. 
for momentarily is what I just mentioned a moment ago. We also have different visualization instead of just the RF spectrum from an uh, FFT perspective, you can also look at it in a spectrogram. If, if we just talk about where we can go, so hopefully you got a sense of the capabilities we have. That's real hardware running in real, consuming data continuously at 64 giga samples per second. Nobody is doing that on Earth except for Intel. Um, if you look at where we can go with this, well, for starters, uh, the chip-to-chip -chip interface, if we just think about AIB, we already have AIB, what can we do? Well, if you look at the part we just had with two data converter tiles and two transceiver tiles with the big FPJ in between. We can actually replace the FPJ with an EASIC. EASIC is a structured ASIC that Intel has that's not a total ASIC, it's a structured pathway between FPJ and ASIC. You could take that FPJ, get your algorithm working, put it to an EASIC. You lose the programmability, but you get a much lower power profile than what's available from the FPJ. Another one is say, uh, in this case, we're just saying, let's put both data converters in the same part. Here we have one that's running 64 giga samples per second. I didn't talk about the other one, I let it fly by, but it's four giga samples at ADC and 12 giga sample DAC. That's optimized for another segment. You can put them both in the same uh, picture. Um, and then this looks at some of the other uh, technology that was demonstrated out there was an optical interconnect directly in the package. So now we can take a data converter. In this case, it's just hooking it up to one of our fabric. These are all just hypotheticals. And then connecting the backhaul instead of transceiver electrically using optical. So those are things we can do today. If you look at what's coming in terms of chip-to-chip -chip interface and a UCIE standard, it's it's very similar. You know, it's still a chiplet-based methodology, and it, all you're doing is saying, okay, what we did previously and used AIB over EMIB, we're actually going to use UCIE. And UCIE is either UCIE standard or advanced, doesn't matter. And these are just concepts, and if we were to do this, we're looking at a bunch of different things, rather, but if we were to generate... Um, an FPGA with UCIE, these are a couple of the things we could do. Well, number one, we can look at next generation data converters that take advantage, advantage of the bandwidth associated with UCIE over AIB. And of course, if we did that, we would uh, do a, a, a transceiver upgrade as well. Another one would be actually adding machine learning, AI accelerator chiplets hanging off the side in conjunction with uh, the data converter and optical. And then finally, you don't need data converters in at all. We've been talking a lot of data converters because that's what we're here to talk about, but you can easily do, in this case, come in optical, get into the fabric, accelerate it with some AI machine learning chiplets and bring it back out optical. So hopefully you got a sense of what we, what we, what we, what we do in terms of our FPJ chiplet-based methodology. Um, and we talked about 64 giga samples per second. I said we have 32 gigahertz of bandwidth that we consume and process in the FPJ. And we have unprecedented frequency agility. It's really, in terms of you look at the capabilities we have, nobody else can do it, as I mentioned. And the reference design tools and boards that go with it allow you to jumpstart your development very quickly. Uh, some disclosures, but um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ben, for an uh, excellent talk. Uh, so Ben warned me ahead of time that uh, this is all leading edge stuff for Intel and that uh, some of the questions you might have uh, might be covered by what they call a limited access agreement. So don't be surprised if uh, right. you get that answer to some of your questions. So questions uh, from Slack. Question from uh, Cliff Young, Google. Well, can you talk about some of the applications for this FPGA? Would they go into a military radar or into the routers of some kind of communication equipment like a, uh, like a cellular-based station or long-haul uh, internet link. Uh, defense could be a potential market, but what drives the 64 giga samples per second designation? So I think I heard a question, the applications, what do we do then? Okay, so I'll try to give a play. I mean, what FPJs are good for is do anything that you want to do. The direct RF kind of says, okay, you want to program the FPJ to do an algorithm of what space do you work in. So the two we talked about, we only really talked about the 64 giga sample. One, that's optimized for or if you want to think of military applications as well as test and measurement, if you look, it's a spectrum analyzer. I showed you a spectrum analyzer. You also optical backhaul 
you know, undersea cables. It's a nice part to be using. So that's, if you want to say those are three quick ones on, on that particular one. Uh, the medium band is a little bit, if you look at the difference and why do you do it, it has more channel count, it has lower uh, power, it has better spectral purity, fidelity. So in terms of comms, wireless, 5G, 5G military, uh, that's where it's optimized for. We didn't talk about that today, but that's another one. A uh, question up here on the left. Yeah. Sarah, if you have any grid comm, speaking of uh, comm and you know, 5G, 6G and so forth, uh, so you talk about heterogeneously integrating uh, different process nodes and, and, and then you talk about optical. Uh, but what about different uh, semiconductor processes and stuff like gallium arsenide and nitride and all of those, which would become more important as we look at energy efficiency of cellular transmitters? So the question is, can we integrate exotics to three, four compounds or something like that inside the package? in addition, is that what you're asking? What well, do you see the trend? What are the challenges? And uh, yeah, so so good. That's that's a good question. So right now, what we focus on is um, uh, so the government under the ship program I mentioned previously is part of the government partners, private partner, public partnership. And we worked on digital. Digital they considered analog, including the A to D, A to D, and data converters. They had another ship RF, which actually looked in RF space, true RF, GAN, and whatever. And the idea is eventually pull them together in the same package. We're not quite there yet, but that's the goal. Would the interconnect still be applicable, or would you need a completely different, you know? I'm sorry. Would chiplets work? Sorry. I.e., would chiplets work? <laughs> uh, will chiplets work in that environment? Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if you do look at the public information available on Ship RF, you can see what they're going down and the capabilities they're enabling people to design real RF and what that's about. So, yeah, it, it is similar concept in the RF domain. Okay. okay. Uh, question from Slack. Yeah, question from Daniel Lowell. Can you comment on the architecture of the 64 giga sample per second ADC? Uh, Can you comment on the uh, architecture of the ADC? The ADC itself? Yeah. Uh, the only thing I'll say is it's an interleaved architecture. We do add compensation networks up there to compensate for the fact that we have an interleaved architecture. That's, that's about what I'll say here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, up here on the left again. Reminiscent Acronics. I was wondering if you could comment on the how did this solution your converters compared to some of the companies that have been around for a long time that have high end uh, converters like uh, ADI and TI? So, so, right, so the data converter triplets, um, the two that are integrated into part are not Intel design. Those are partners who generate um, their data converters. Typically, what they did pre pre previously, their initial data converter was done in a CERDES, a transform, uh, trans. Uh, CERDES block, and then what they did was they replaced the CERDES with the AIB interface. And moving forward, you're going to see that the data converter companies understand and are going to embrace the chiplet because it allows them to have more capabilities, and they'll start with uh, some interface and bring that to the table before the transceiver-based version. If you look at what we did for um, uh, the medium band one, uh, we did not have a chance to redesign the signal processing path because that was already done with a transceiver-based part. How However, uh, are the AIB capabilities, and that part we're only using two-thirds the AIB shore, shore length because they just didn't have the shore length to give us, and in that we doubled all the RF bandwidth and we gave a mode that's not even available by, we were just able to tap off to the previous decimator stage in the half band length equivalent. I'm over. No, I'm sorry. It's... Okay. Well, thank you very much, Ben. That was excellent. Sorry. So our Good last luck. talk is uh, highly appropriate for hot chips. It's about how do you get all that heat away from those hot chips so that they don't burn up. Um, the uh, speaker is Ian uh, Winfield. Uh, title is Additive Manufacturing. Um, I mean, Electrochemical Additive Manufacturing, ECAM, for cooling high-performance uh, integrated circuits. Um, Ian is the VP of Product and Applications at Fabricate Labs. He has over 15 years experience across materials research and development, aerospace composite structures, satellite communications, and metal additive manufacturing. He holds a master's in applied science at, and in materials science and engineering from University of Toronto and an MBA from San Diego State University. Uh, Ian, uh, let's see how this works. Hi everyone, good evening. 
Uh, thank you, Forrest. And uh, it's really a privilege to be speaking here uh, at Hopchip, at Hopchip to all of you um, among so many talented engineers and excellent speakers. And thanks to all of you for sticking it through to the last talk. We're almost to the finish line. Um, Forrest said, my name is Ian Winfield. I'm excited to talk about some of the work that my colleagues and I have been doing using additive manufacturing as a solution to bring new thermal management products uh, for high-performance computing applications. So just to give a quick overview of what we're going to talk about, um, we're all well aware of the increasing performance and power of CPUs, GPUs, and the increasing thermal load that that's creating in these devices, which is driving a shift towards liquid cooling and innovations in the liquid cooling space. The current the state of the art products used in liquid cooling is your typical microchannel cold plate. It's generally produced via a sky beam methodology, but these linear designs have limited performance and we're going to get into that in a bit more details. What we've been working on is using electrochemical additive manufacturing, or ECAM, to create complex cold plate structures that have demonstrated a 35% improvement in thermal performance. And where we're really trying to take this technology is to utilize ECAM, ECAM to provide a solution for mass manufacturing of application-optimized designs uh, for thermal management. So to get into the details, um, Demand for liquid cooling in data centers is growing. When we look at the energy consumption in the data center, in the range of about 40% of the total energy is going used just to remove heat from the system. So this makes the thermal management solution a real consideration when we're looking at the total cost of ownership of a data center, how much of that energy is being used to get heat out instead of drive the system for the performance that you really want. And we're also seeing, as, as uh, we're seeing in many of the talks here, the increasing level of uh, CPU and GPU performance is necessitating the shift away from air cooling into liquid cooling solutions. Uh, the primary method of using uh, liquid cooling today is the liquid cold plate. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the char characteristics there. When we think about a liquid cold plate where we're pumping coolant through, putting it onto the die or onto the integrated heat spreader, we can qualify the performance or quantify the performance in terms of its thermal resistance and its pressure drop. So we obviously want low thermal resistance so we can transfer heat into the coolant and we want a low pumping power, meaning we don't want to spend that much energy on the pump to pump the liquid through the cold plate and that's proportional to the pressure drop that we would see across the cold plate as the liquid is going across. The other thing that we're looking for is temperature uniformity, and this is to manage the non-uniform heat inputs that we're seeing. So the state of the art looks like the image that you see in the middle of the slide here. This is a microchannel cold plate, typically in copper, um, and the typical dimensions of these fins and these channels is in the range of about 100 microns. Uh, they're they're well known for manufacturing, they're well understood in analysis and performance, but there are some limitations of these products. Primarily what we see is the fluid is traversing that channel. So this image in the top right, you're kind of looking at a top-down view with the two fins on the top and the bottom. You develop a boundary layer as the fluid is traversing across the cold plate, and that is going to reduce your convective heat transfer into the fluid. And you can't just solve the problem by pumping the liquid faster because then you're going to start to reach the erosion limits of the copper itself and the erosion limits of the tubing. So it really necessitates new designs and new methods of getting the coolant into the system and, and to remove the heat. So that's where we're looking at additive manufacturing. Uh, additive manufacturing, it can unlock a new wave of thermal management products. It can create previously impossible to manufacture designs that really can maximize the combination of your conductive and your convective heat transfer through, through complex structures. Uh, we've been recently very interested in these triply periodic minimal surface structures. Mostly have been studied in heat exchanger applications. We're starting to look at them in liquid cooling applications. And we can create these high surface area shape optimized structures uh, based on any three-dimensional design. Uh, we can also use generative AI to create software developed solutions that are designed for a specific application, a specific heat map. Uh, we can use generative AI to cool the chip that we use to generate the product. And, and that's really exciting. We can create application specific thermal solutions uh, to address these non-uniform temperatures, to address the hydraulic requirements of the system, and we think that's really interesting. 
but additive manufacturing hasn't really been adopted widely, metal additive manufacturing, and in particular it hasn't been adopted into the electronics value chain. And that's for a number of reasons. The first is that most metal additive manufacturing technologies that are available today, they're based off of metal powders, and they're based off of thermal processes. And that drives high cost and complexity. You have to depowder and remove that powder from the system. So when you look at complex, high resolution structures, in many cases, you can't get the powder out of these fine structures. The powder is approximately the same size as the feature that you're trying to manufacture. By using a new technology that we've developed, we call it electrochemical added manufacturing, or ECAM. It's an electroplating based chemistry. So it's a water-based solution with metal ions. So there's no powder. So we eliminate the powder problem. And, uh, and because it's happening at room temperature in an electrochemical fashion, we also eliminate any need for thermal processing. Because of that, Capability, it gives you a couple other advantages. Uh, high resolution, so I'll talk a little bit about, more about that in a moment, but feature size is in the range of 50 to 70 microns today. Uh, high surface finish, and then the capability to do pure copper, which is challenging in laser-based systems. You typically have to alloy the material because of the reflectivity of the copper, and in, and in the sintering operation, uh, it's challenging to get to the full density. So how does electrochemical additive manufacturing work? So in the middle of the slide here, um, you see a representation of our build chamber. Um, electrochemical added manufacturing is really the convergence of display technology and electrochemistry. So that blue rectangle that you see on the bottom of the build chamber is based off of display technology. That is a microelectrode array. Today it's comprised of a little over 8 million individual pixels with a pixel pitch of 33 microns. And then we're building on that top plate. So you can imagine top parts are being built upside down and they're getting pulled away from the printhead as they're being built. So the way that that process then works is we'll take the three-dimensional model, like other additive manufacturing, we'll slice that into layers, and then we'll convert those layers into bitmaps that correspond to those 33 micron pixels that are on our printhead. So we can activate whatever pattern we want. And then we would take our water-based feedstock. This is very similar to uh, copper-based plating solutions that you might see in PCB or semiconductor manufacturing, um, widely available metal salts. We flow that across the printhead and we bring the two plates very close together. You'll see in the top right a, a graphic of that. When I say close together, we're, we're talking also in the range of the pixel pitch, so about 30 micron layer height. You can think of the build as a, a 30 micron voxel, roughly, that we're building. And then we will activate those patterns from the slices. That will create a localized electric field on the cathode, which is that top plate, and we'll get localized metal deposition. It's kind of the opposite of what you want when you're doing um, electroplating. Um, but in the case of a nice analogy that folks are probably very familiar with, if you think about, let's say, a photo mask, where you're removing that photo mask, you're plating into vias or plating into traces. Rather than using a photo mask, we're using a digital mask, and we're digitally masking the anode, which means we can do it dynamically, and we can, we can do it in real time to create a three-dimensional structure. And we can also use each pixel as a sensor. So that's what we're representing in the bottom right here. Um, so each pixel is measuring how basically effectively how close the metal is to that pixel. And it's giving us a response and it's using that information to drive the printing algorithm to manage the growth across the build area. The bottom right image is representing a, a BCC lattice, three-dimensional lattice structure that we're building. And this is all happening at room temperature. So it, it enables a pretty wide range of thermal management products liquid cold plates, uh, vapor chambers, oscillating heat pipes, immersion cooling boiler plates, to name a few. Um, and those products can take advantage of what ECAM can offer, which is an additive design advantage, meaning microscale feature resolution, full design freedom to get the three-dimensional structure that you want, high thermal conductivity because it's pure copper, and competitive economics that with a scalable manufacturing method because it's a low-cost metal salt feedstock and it's room temperature, it's low energy. Um, we're also taking advantage of the electrochemical capability to print structures directly onto a substrate. So we could print onto a copper sheet, we could print onto a metallized PCB, ceramic with DBC direct bond copper, or um, silicon with a metallized surface. In this case, we're looking at um, a, a copper fin that's been printed onto an OFHC, oxygen free high conductivity rolled copper substrate. When we look at a mechanical grind and polish on the image on the left, you can't see the interface. 
we took it through a fairly aggressive chemical etch, a ferric chloride etch, which is intentionally designed to attack the grain boundaries, so you can observe the grain boundaries in the copper material. And you will see that, you'll start to see the interface there, which is effectively a high angle grain boundary. And when you look at it in the ion beam, so we take the ion beam, we use the ion beam to effectively ablate away the material, cutting into the interface, and then the ion beam contra uh, imaging will allow you to see grain contrast based off the reflection of the ion and the grain orientation. So what you see in that image on the right is the very large, I say very large, uh, grain of the rolled copper. And then you'll see the interface, and then we're transitioning to the very fine-grained copper material that we've deposited. So the grain size of the printed material is on the order of about 500 nanometers, um, average grain size, give or take. Um, it's a pretty high current density process, which drives that nucleation during the build. Uh, and, and the finer grain size does give you a little bit of strengthening as effect of the hull patch relationship. Um, uh, of course, it can be annealed to get to a coarser grain size. So back to cold plates. Um, here's the structures that we've evaluated for the liquid cooling applications. Uh, you have your encumbered microchannel, 100 micron wall thickness, and we've selected uh, these two gyroid structures, similar in design, but they have different open area or, or different open volume, if you will. So a 50% open volume gyroid structure and an 80% open volume gyroid structure. And one of the things that's important when we look at uh, cold plates is the surface area per unit volume, because that's how we're moving heat from the copper into the coolant. Um, and you might make some conclusions based on these numbers, but the, that's not the only factor. Uh, we, we think about that boundary layer that I mentioned on the earlier slide. So here's the articles that we printed. Um, we printed them onto a 25 millimeter by 23 millimeter OFHC copper substrate, a um, little over a millimeter thick. Uh, you can see the nominal dimensions there. Um, but more importantly, when we took a look at them a little bit closer up, uh, we saw pretty good result in terms of the dimensional accuracy of the process to deliver to the intended design. Uh, and actually in both cases, the wall thicknesses uh, of these two designs were approximately the same. The measured wall thickness of the 50% gyroid is just under 110 microns. And the one on the right, the 80% gyroid was just over 110 microns. So good accuracy from the printing process, which is what we had hoped for and expected, um, and brings us into the, the next steps here. So. We wanted to test them, of course. Uh, so we built a manifold. You see that manifold with the orange block underneath it. And that manifold is capable of receiving all of these different cold plates. So we really wanted to say, how do we compare these different cold plates to each other um, in a test setup um, and with a cooling loop, basically. We used water in this cooling setup. Um, and then we had our heat input. You see the image that's second from the right. Uh, this aluminum block with a with a heater in it, and we made that 10 by 10 millimeters, and we cut a notch in it, mounted a thermocouple in there to represent T case. We also had thermocouples on the inlet and the outlet, along with um, pressure sensors, so we could measure the pressure drop across the cold plate. And here are the results. Um, the 80 percent. Oh, sorry. The chart uh, is showing the thermal resistance on the y-axis that we measured. Uh, by the T case, um, uh, delta T, T case minus T in of the coolant and the heat input into the system. And then on the, the X axis, we're showing the pumping power, which is a product of the volumetric flow rate and the pressure drop across the plate. So it's a, a way to, to measure how much, how much energy you're going to have to put into your pump to pump the fluid across. So we really want, on this chart, is we want to be down and to the left down is higher performance, to the left is lower total cost of ownership. And the 80% gyroid wasn't that interesting, but as we got into the finer structure, the 50% gyroid showed a 35% improvement in thermal resistance, meaning lower thermal resistance, at an equivalent pumping power. And one of the things that we are working to do is analyze these structures. They're quite complex when we do the mesh for CFD. Um, but we're working with some partners in order to, to get that. We're hoping to get there soon to be able to analyze these uh, at their scale. So we're pretty, pretty excited about these results and, wh and where we're going with them. So what does that mean for us going forward? Uh, the conclusions and the future work. 
Um, so first of all, in, in these uh, thermal test vehicles, these TTVs, we're able to show that there's a 35% improvement by adopting this complex structure. We think that the result of that structure is due to the mixing, the more torturous flow path as the fluid is traversing across the cold plate. Um, and then where we're going with this is looking at application specific cooling structures that can take advantage of the generative design, that can take advantage of these complex and uh, graded structures to really deliver application optimized cooling products at high scale. And we're starting to see, I'll share a little bit of what, where we're, we're going and some of the stuff we've just started working on. So the image on the, the left here, this is the same part. The top image is the front view and then if you rotate it 90 degrees, it's the image on the, the bottom. And this is a graded structure, so this is combining the 50% gyroid structure and the 80% 80, 80 gyroid structure. You see that in the top middle, 50%, and it's going out to the corner, 80. And then in the top left of the bottom image, going down to the bottom right is going 50 to 80. So we can grade it on multiple dimensions. You can grade it based on the inlet, on the outlet, on the hot spots. And so we're, we're pretty excited about that. And then we're, we're starting to use generative AI, AI, as I mentioned. This is an early two-dimensional example, a uh, recent result that we got. And in both of these cases, we're, we're working to develop the capability to analyze these really complex uh, high surface area structures on the left. And we're partnering with uh, software folks that can help us use generative AI that can work in the feature sizes that we want. Uh, very, it's challenging when we decrease the feature size into the 70 micron range to run those um, generative solutions, so we're collaborating with some partners in that space. And thanks very much for listening, and uh, oh sorry, wrap it up on the summary. <laughs> False alarm, we're almost there, we're almost there. Um, so in summary, increased power dissipation, we all saw this, we saw it in the Google talk on the first day, talking about liquid cooling, is requiring these new thermal management solutions. Today they're based off of these um, microchannel cold plates, uh, but as we saw, they have some limited performance. Um, and so what we're demonstrating thus far is a 35% improvement in the thermal resistance of a cold plate product by taking advantage of three-dimensional structures with more torturous flow paths. And we really see ECAM as a solution for mass manufacturing of these application-optimized designs by taking advantage of graded structures and generative designs. And that's the last slide. Thank you. And uh, just between us, uh, Ian promises me that he can get that down to 50% from 35%. So we might see some more progress here. So uh, questions uh, from Slack for starters? Yeah, uh, great talk, thanks. Uh, this is a question from Cliff Young, Google. Uh, can particles fleck off of the 3D printed structure during operation? And if so, is that an issue in operation of liquid cooling systems? Do we need to add filters in the cooling loop or do we already have them? Yeah, the, as the as printed material is dense, it's not a particle fusing operation, it's, it's depositing at the atomic level, so we don't see any type of flaking behavior, so I wouldn't see any type of filtration other than what's already utilized in the system or maybe if there's smaller pore sizes just to capture any filtration for smaller pore sizes, but no, no flaking of the material. Thank you. We haven't observed that. Uh, up here on the left. Yeah, Nathan Brookwood, Insight 64. Uh, two questions. One, how do you attach the cooling device to the chip that it's cooling? Yeah, typically there is a thermal interface material, and usually it's mechanically fixed to the, the board. Um, so usually mechanical. So pretty much the same way you would do it with the old-fashioned micro channels. Yeah, that's right. It's, we're looking at it as kind of just dropping in a different cooling channel structure into the similar types of cooling architectures that they have today. And secondly, have you done any lifetime testing on these devices to see what happens after they've been in use for simulated? Yes. That, not yet. That is on our to-do list. So right now, it's, you're still betting on the come here. Yeah, right now we're focused on the performance testing, but if we look at the microstructure and the material, we're not anticipating anything different than what we see in normal copper. Um, it's a 99.95% pure with a 500 nanometer grain size, so we, we expect uh, to perform in a comparable manner on reliability, but it will be necessitated to go through those exercises. Okay, I was going to ask about immersion cooling, but I'm, they see a line behind me, so I won't. Yeah. No so test data yet, but we're looking at that. 
Yeah. In theory, you could uh, plate these uh, structures directly onto ICs if there was a passivation layer. Uh, next up here on the left. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's do the right. Uh, George Kozma from Chips and Cheese. Could so not all data centers can transition or even want to transition over to water cooling. Could you potentially use this same process to create air better air coolers and more effective air coolers? That's definitely a possibility. Uh, just that the structures we've been seeing some of the most traction and have been in liquid cooling. So we're seeing more movement to adopt new hardware in that space mm -hmm. where a lot of the folks with existing air cooling infrastructure might not want to invest new capex there. Thank you. Yeah. Also, the uh, um, return value for liquid cooling is higher. I mean, just that's a business proposition. Uh, Slack? Yeah. Uh, how long does it, uh, sorry, question from Kazui Hironoka, Hitachi. Uh, how long does it take to, uh, to print it out? Yeah, good question. Uh, so it's an area-based printing process. So we print all voxels in a layer simultaneously. And depending on the exact geometry, the production build rate is about one to two millimeters per hour vertically. So what does that work out to for something? To yeah, I say cold plate is maybe three, four millimeters. So three, three to four to one and a half to two hours. And we might think about on a build plate, maybe building four to six uh, cold plates at a time. Up uh, here on the left now. Hi, Charlie Demergent, semi-accurate. Um, do you have the ability to put in uh, removable structures for non-contiguous uh, designs? That's definitely something that we think about. The way that we, it certainly could be mechanically removed um, if, if you wanted to do that. We also think about creating, uh, but most of the structures are high surface area to volume, but we think about creating even higher surface area to volume structures that would etch away at faster etch rates to chemically etch away those structures. So it, it becomes design dependent, but certainly structures could be removed. Uh, on the right. Sang Min Lee from previous AI. So do you think that the uh, uh, same process can work for other materials such as aluminum? Good, good question, yeah. So uh, unfortunately, aluminum is much further on the roadmap. It uses a molten salt, uh, which is a much more aggressive environment. What does work well for us is anything that's an aqueous or water-based chemistry. So copper, nickel, uh, cobalt, nickel cobalt alloys, um, platinum, palladium, gold. Uh, we have some tungsten alloys. So unfortunately, not aluminum uh, in the near term, but uh, it is on the long-term roadmap. Okay, thank you. It's hard to plate aluminum. <laughs> yeah, it is made in an electrochemical process, just a very aggressive one. Uh, uh, from Slack? Yeah, question from Partha Kundu. Uh, what's a gyroid and what are the advantages of a gyroid over a micro channel? Gyroid. Yeah, gyroid. So, sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so gyroid falls into a category called a triply periodic minimal surface structure. Um, and there's a whole wide range of different types of TPMS structures and a lot of literature on them in heat exchangers. Um, they do a good job of having a high surface area, but more importantly, creating a very complex flow path through the plate so that we can, if you can imagine the fluid is, rather than going just linearly across the surface, we can drive more impingement onto the plate as the fluid is traversing and that helps to remove more heat through convective heat transfer. I think you have to remember in this process, turbulence is good. <laughs> um, on the right? Uh, Michael Lowry from NASA. Could you use the same kind of uh, plating technology through pixels for, say, doing radiative uh, cooling so that you build up intricate structures, 3D, that are able to radiate better uh, than just flat plates, for yeah. example. Yeah, definitely. Um, we're doing some analysis on some designs that show that. Oh, really? Uh, but not as much uh, printing them yet. We've been really been prioritizing the liquid cooling uh, activities. Thank you. Yeah. Um, up here uh, on the left. Dave Armstrong from Advantest. How big a surface area can you plate over? Yeah, great question. So the, it's all limited by the, the build plate, sorry, by the printhead, which is that the rectangle that was on the bottom. So today that area is 100 by 80 millimeters. 
Okay. And then we're going to scale that up into roughly the 130 by 130 ish range. We're still finalizing the design millimeter. And then beyond that, it'll be a decision on do we go more rectangular or more square. Um, and really, it comes down to the fluid mechanics of the system. When we're moving these two plates and there's fluid going in between them, because the, the actual printheads themselves are already manufactured on you know, sheets of glass that are several meters by several meters. So we're definitely scaling up and we're always taking feedback on the products that might necessitate a quicker or larger scale up. And when will you be shipping? Uh, yeah, uh, to talk about the business then, I, right now we're all in an R&D phase, so small proof of concepts, um, you know, parts, typically less than 10 parts in a POC, but we're building a pilot facility uh, in San Diego, which will become online in early 2024, starting the qualification in that uh, timeline. And you've done POCs? Oh yeah, uh, can we talk about them? Uh, not in great detail, I can just say that the POCs are kind of spanning a pretty wide range of, of liquid cooling uh, to RF applications. We're also doing some antenna structures and then uh, some medical devices. So we're, we look at ourselves as really a, a manufacturing technology provider who will provide the service by operating the equipment ourselves and giving parts to our partners and customers. Uh, on the left, uh, Don Draper from Pope Principia. So you'd mentioned using uh, different uh, chemical solutions for your liquid, <clears throat> uh, aqueous and other solutions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm wondering, how do you optimize the uh, thermal heat transfer across the barrier using these different uh, chemicals? And is it possible, like in, uh, uh, is it possible to use a, a, a electric bias on, on these solutions relative to the metal structure to improve the uh, thermal uh, transfer. Hmm, that, I like the question. I don't know if I have a great answer for it. Um, yeah, I, I think it's an interesting thing. I'll have to think about that. Uh, I don't have a great answer in the, in the actual cooling solution of how that might work, but I think it's pretty interesting. Thank you. Uh, on the right, one more. Uh, hi, uh, me again. <laughs> um, just real quick, could you maybe do like a mix of um, materials, so let's say a hundred um, micron layer of gold followed by copper for thermal conductivity reasons? Yeah, that's that's possible. Um, by Basically, we would alternate feedstock and with a rinse step in between. Um, most of the, the demonstrations that we've done there are in pretty, pretty small scale setups, uh, but it is something that's in the capability set. Thank you again. Yeah. Well, uh, this has been terrific, and I think this is uh, amazing uh, what you can do. I've, I've seen the structures myself. Uh, did you bring any? To yeah, we have some, in? and my so colleague Tim is here as well. Wants so to come up and take a look. You can at see the, the one that was in the picture in person. The actual results. It's much smaller. Uh, they're really cool to see.